Okay, today we're going to do e-cells, and e-cells is kind of a big chunky topic, so if I don't get to cover it in this video, it might get too long or something, I'll split it into two parts, but we'll see, I might get into the flow of things. So let's start with two reactions. Magnesium reacts to form its two plus ion, and two electrons, that's a shoddy two, two electrons, and this is aqueous and copper doing the exact same thing. So copper will form its two plus ion its solution and two electrons. Now you should know that one of these reactions is going to be more reactive than the other and that's magnesium. If you've ever tried to burn magnesium and copper well that speaks for itself which one's more reactive and the reasons for that I'm not going to go into but it's all to do with like orbitals and stuff, but anyway. So we know that magnesium is more reactive, but this whole thing about E cells is trying to put how reactive these reactions are into numbers form. And we do that with the use of E cells. So let's look at just how reactive magnesium is. If we draw out a beaker. Again, I've never claimed to be good at art. If you draw out a beaker and stick in a strip of magnesium and stick it in some water, magnesium is going to react. It's going to do this reaction. Some of these little chunks of magnesium are going to come off and form the 2 plus ion. So it's going to be the 2 plus ion and it's going to leave behind two electrons. And that's going to happen quite a lot because magnesium is quite reactive. It's going to form a lot of 2 plus ions in here and a lot of electrons left on the magnesium strip. But when this has happened, some of the ions are going to want to go back. And let's draw out that happening. So we have our magnesium strip, we have our water. And then some of these two plus ions are going to want to go back onto the magnesium strip, taking up two electrons and essentially doing the reverse of this reaction. So we're going to go this way. And that's going to continue until we get to a point where the reaction going forward and backwards has reached an equilibrium, a dynamic equilibrium. So this will still be happening. We'll still see ions coming off and going back on, but it will have reached a state where the overall amount of ions in the solution is going to remain pretty much constant. And we can use this concept to kind of put into numbers th this reaction. So if we compare what's happening with magnesium and what would happen with copper, we see something pretty interesting. So we have our magnesium. and our water. And what's going to happen with magnesium is that we're going to end up, because it's reactive, with quite a lot of 2 plus ions in the solution and quite a lot of electrons left on the strip. And then if we compare that with what happens in copper, because copper is less reactive than magnesium, then we see that there is less 2 plus ions being left in the solution than magnesium and less electrons being left on the copper strip. So if we write out the two reactions that are happening here, we can compare how we can compare their positions in equilibrium. So we have Mg it's aqueous. Sorry, I messed that up. We have magnesium in its aqueous with a 2 plus charge plus 2 electrons in a reversible reaction with solid magnesium. And we have the exact same with copper. In a reversible reaction with solid copper. 
So, oh, and the way that I've written this with the electrons on the left, that's just what the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry has deemed to be necessary, and that's actually quite useful because when I'm talking about it, when I talk about the equilibrium being on the left, if there is a standard way of writing it, I don't need to write down the equation for you to know which side it's on. So, if we look at what's happening here and compare it with this equilibrium equation, we can see that there is quite a lot of these two plus ions and electrons. So this side of the equation is kind of more prominent than this side. So the equilibrium is going to lie somewhere on the left. But in copper, there is less of these two plus, two plus ions and electrons. So the equilibrium is still going to be on the left somewhere, but it's going to be less on the left. So it's going to be about there. So if we draw this in like visual terms and imagine the position of equilibrium as straight lines for magnesium and copper with the ideal middle ground, magnesium is going to be over here somewhere with quite far on the left and copper is going to be a lot less on the left. So if we can measure the difference between, if we can measure the potent, the difference in charge between this a slightly positive solution and slightly negative electrode, then we can figure out a number that's going to allow us to put into numbers where on this equilibrium this lies. So we can tell how reactive it is. So if we measured it and there was a very big difference, as seen here with magnesium being a lot further to the left, we could say that that is more reactive than copper, and that lines up with what we know. But doing that is a lot more difficult than it sounds. We can't just stick a wire on here and then attach that to a voltmeter and stick a wire into the solution. It doesn't work that way. We can't, we can't have that. So instead what we have to do is refer it to something that we call a standard reference electrode. And I just need to explain the concept behind that. So let's forget the chemistry for a moment and imagine that we have a set of scales. Here's my lovely set of scales. Like this, that we use to compare weights of things. And they have a slider on it with the numbers 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, and then 1, 2. So we have two weights, and we don't know what they are. They are a mystery to us. We just know that this bigger weight weighs more than this tiny weight. But we can't figure out how much they weigh. Sure, we could like kind of feel them and try and get a roundabout number for what we think they weigh, but that's really inaccurate. So we go outside and we find a rock. This is our rock. And when we put this rock on here, obviously this side is going to go down and this side is going to go up. But we can use that setup to compare the weights that we have here with this rock. So. Let's use the small weight, this, and then the big weight, and draw out the scenarios. So, with our small weight, our rock weighs a lot more. So, what's going to happen? So, I should draw this with what's actually going to happen. Let's just erase that, and then we can draw this. So, the rock weighs a lot more. So the left side of the arm is going to go up, and the right side of the arm... No, the left side of the arm is going to go down, sorry, and the right side is going to go up. When we put our little weight on there. And on our reading, it says there's zero. That's when it was at normal. And then it says that now it's on one. Minus one, sorry. So then when we put our big weight on what happens is that it goes down 
So this side of the arm goes down, and this one goes up with our rock on it. And that tells us, on the reading, that this number is 2. Now we haven't worked out the exact weights of these weights, but what we can do is say if we label our rock as a weight of 0, even though it does have a weight, but if we just call it 0, then we can say in reference to all of these weights that we stick on there, we can measure the difference in weight between our standard rock and our weights. And this will give us what's called the reference rock. So we can then say that the rock has a weight of 0, the small weight has a weight of minus 1, and the big weight has a weight of 2. Now obviously that's not reality. The, the little weight doesn't float off in the air, it doesn't have minus weight. It's just in reference to the rock, it has a weight of minus 1. And this concept we use in E cells. We get an electrode and we compare other things to it. So what do we call our reference electrode? Well, it's the standard hydrogen electrode. And you need to know a few things about its design. So let's draw one. Very art heavy lesson this. So we end we start with a test tube like this and we submerge it in a bit of water. And through the top of the test tube we stick in a platinum wire with a big ball of platinum foil and platinum on the end. So this is platinum and what we do then is we pump hydrogen gas into here at a set pressure and this solution I should draw it in light blue so this solution is heavily acidic so what will happen is an equilibrium will establish between the aqueous solution of H plus ions the electrons that will gather on the platinum and our H2 gas. And this we give a value of zero. We say that this cell is zero. And then what we can do is attach other cells to it and a voltmeter and we can see which, how all of these compare to the other, how the, all the other electrodes, sorry, compare to this one. But let's go more into detail on that. Oh, and for, you need to know some things about the standard part of this hydrogen electrode. Because this equilibrium has been set up, there are lots of factors that can affect the equilibrium, such as like temperature, pressure, and concentration of this uh, acidic liquid. So there are some standard conditions that we associate with the standard hydrogen electrode. We have a pressure of 100 kilopascals, and this is like often quoted as one atmosphere in old textbooks, but you really need to learn the current way of saying this of 100 kilopascals. You should be familiar from that from the uh, ideal gas equation. A temperature of 298 Kelvin, which is 25 degrees Celsius, basically room temperature, and a concentration in this acidic solution of 1 mole per decimeter minus 3. And this goes for all of the other cells as well. When you have a, when you submerge your magnesium strip into the solution of magnesium ions, the magnesium ions will be one mole per decimeter cubed. And that's just so that everything is standard. So let's look at what a cell is simply before we go on to talking about how we link all this up. So a cell, very basically we have two of our sticks stuck in our solution. We have a wire connecting them to a voltmeter. And then we have another metal in its solution. 
and then between them, so that we can connect the circuit, we have something called a salt bridge, which is uh, simply just a... The, you should be in the water. But the, that is just simply a small round tube filled with uh, electrolytes, ions basically, and stuffed with cotton wool at the end so that the, when you stick it into these solutions it doesn't just entirely mix with them. There, there will still be leaking and that's what you want because you want to complete the circuit but just so that it doesn't all entirely pour into one and you've ruined your cell. And also the these electrolytes are chosen so that they don't react with the things in here so a lot of kind of preparation goes into making one of these cells. So we call this a cell. This is our electrochemical cell. So we call it a cell. And each one of these sections of the cell, these single bits, are called our electrodes. Electrodes. Gonna have to write in there, but anyway, electrodes. So these are our electrodes, and two of them together make a cell. So let's now like link it together with the magnesium and the copper to show what I mean. So we make two cells. We can we suck together our hydrogen electrode, which I'm going to draw really sloppily just to illustrate my point. We connect our hydrogen electrode with the platinum in it to a voltmeter, and then connect the wire to our magnesium in its solution. So, if we boil this down to its basic components, forgetting about the salt bridge, if we boil this down to our basic components, we can draw a very simple drawing. We can say we have our ball of platinum, which is where all the electrons gather, our wire to the voltmeter, and to our magnesium. And this is the basic structure of the cell like it wouldn't work without all the other things but this is just the bit that we need to focus on so let's look at the two reactions happening here again we have our reaction of magnesium ions and the two electrons in the reversible reaction between the solid magnesium and we have our two hydrogen ions, the two electrons in a reversible reaction with hydrogen gas. Now in this reaction what's going to happen is the magnesium is going to, as we saw before in the water, build up a lot of these electrons because it's quite reactive. That's still that's going to happen on this electrode as well. The hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen ions are going to react. The equilibrium is going to be on the left, and we're going to get some electrons built up on here. But there is a difference in the amount, the amount of electrons, on this side to this side. So the electrons are going to try and flow this way, and push against this resistant voltmeter. Now, when that happens, the voltmeter measures something called the potential difference. And that is the difference between these two cells. So in this case, the voltmeter says 2.37. And this is a number we can use to compare all of these metal reactions in their reactivity. But because this electrode has the most negative stuff on it, this is referred to as the negative electrode. So this value is going to be negative. The value, the electron flow is going to be negative 2.37 in this direction because the electrons are actually flowing in this direction. So then let's look at what happens with copper. With copper, the exact, let's boil it down to the same components again. So we have our platinum electrode and we have the wire going up to the voltmeter going down to our copper electrode. 
and we have the two reactions again with the hydrogen and the copper. But this time, the copper, as we saw, isn't very active, so it's only going to build up a small amount of electrons, and the platinum electrode is going to build up a lot of electrons. So the electrons are going to try and flow this way. And the reading on the voltmeter says 0 0.34 volts. And that's because the difference in these two electrodes is referred to as 0 0.34. And because this copper electrode is now less negative, this is positive. And this is kind of a, a wacky idea, because when we're saying that this is the negative electrode and this is the positive electrode, it's easy to think that that means that this copper electrode is going to be actually positive, and it's not. It's negative. It's just less positive than this. It's just less negative than this side. Sorry. Hang on. I screwed this up somewhere along the line. Okay, let's start again. So, try not to rub out everything I've done. So, when we refer to this as the positive electrode, it's not because it's actually got a positive charge, it still has a negative charge, but it simply has a less negative charge than the platinum electrode. So in the same way that 0 0.4 is more negative than 2.4, because it is closer to 0 on the number scale, so with 0 and 0 0.4 and then 2.4, 0 0.4 is more negative than 2.4. So if we hooked up these two cells, this would be the negative electrode, and this would be the positive electrode, because this is more negative. It, just, it doesn't mean that it is negative, it is just more negative. So, let's go back. So, we can use these values and assign them to the equilibrium reaction that this cell is going under know that this electrode is going under. Because our platinum electrode is zero, we can just say that each of these values we can assign to our equilibrium reaction. So the reaction Cu aqueous 2 plus plus 2e minus the reversible reaction to the copper solid has a value of positive 0 0.34 volts. And this is measured in something that we call, and this is kind of a weird name, it's called electromotive force, often referred to as EMF. And what this is, is basically the ability of the electrons to push against this voltmeter, because this is a bit of physics now. The voltmeter is resistant. It basically stops the flow of electrons, because any electrons that do flow ruin the potential difference between the cells and you want to measure an accurate one as you can so it has resistance it stops the electrons and the kind of push of the electrons is measured in something that we call electromotive force just emf and the si the symbol for this is e with the little dot with the line cell so this is the e cell this is where the term e cell comes from really this is the what we assign to a cell it's number that shows us how reactive it is. So I need to start a new layer here, I've run out of space entirely, okay. Start a new layer, get back up to the top. Okay, so that's all well and good. Now we can say that magnesium, let's just draw it here, hopefully I've got the right colour this time, magnesium uh, the reaction of magnesium, 2 plus aqueous plus 2e minus mg. I didn't draw the reversible reaction because, again, we just, when it's written down in exams and things, it is a reversible reaction, but they like to just write it this way and then tell you that this has a value of minus 2.37 volts. And that's why it confuses a lot of people, because they think that they should flip it over and it should uh, change this sign. But we'll do some of these calculations in the next video. So, magnesium, this reaction has a value of minus 2.37 volts in relation, 
no, it's sorry, in comparison to the hydrogen electrode. And copper. has should put the solid copper has a value an e cell value of positive 0 0.34 volts in relation to the hydrogen electrode and this is how we figure out all of our e cell values we can then stick these in order and find out which one is the most reactive, which one is the least reactive. And we have a number to solidify that that we can do calculations with. And we'll get onto that next time. But you noticed when I was drawing all of those cells, it took rather a long time. So we like to do a quick way of drawing a cell. It's called cell notation. So if we think back to our platinum electrode, we had the platinum electrode here, platinum, no, what was I talking about, the cells that we drew before. We have the platinum electrode and then that goes to our metal electrode. And the way that we write this down is kind of unintuitive at first, but it actually does make a lot of sense. The way that we write this, let's write it in red, this is our platinum electrode and then this is our copper electrode. The way that we write this is the symbol for this electrode followed by a bracket of H2 gas because the hydrogen is flowing over it and then we use a line and then we write down the other component of the electrode because this is composed of platinum and this H plus aqueous solution and then we use a double line and then we move on to the other part of the cell, the other electrode, and this will be Cu2 plus aqueous, and then a line, and then Cu solid. Now, I told you this was unintuitive at first, but bear with me. You just need to know what all of this means. So these lines, these single lines, this represents a change in phase. What do I mean by that? Well, you can see here we're going from a solid and a gas to an aqueous solution. We have changed state. We've gone from solid to aqueous. As here, we've gone from aqueous to solid. So that's what these are. And this double line represents our salt bridge. So w what we've essentially done is traced Let's just draw our salt bridge on here, so this is our salt bridge. We have traced over the cell in a direction and used that to write down what the cell is. So we have gone from our platinum to our aqueous solution. So we've gone platinum to the aqueous across the salt bridge shown by these double lines. So across the salt bridge into the aqueous copper solution and onto the copper electrode. So then that's going to go this way around. And th there are a lot of variations within this. We can have, um, we can skip off these twos, we can add extra, like, um, we can add extra mole accounts to things. It's, it varies a lot, but the simple way of showing it, we, and, I mean, we can get rid of these brackets as well and include another single line here. It's all very weird, and you'll see it written a lot of different ways. But the overall idea is that we have one electrode and then another electrode. And this shows you the way that the cell is arranged. And when it is written like this, it is given one of those EMF values. So this one would have an EMF value of positive 0 0.34 volts. And when they give you an EMF value, it always shows you the EMF of the electron on, no, the um, electrode on the right. And that's because of some reasons that we'll go into next time when we do the calculations. So that's it. We've blazed through the entire of E cells in, what, about half an hour. Thank you for watching it, and I will see you in the next video when we go over all the calculations behind this.